Assalamu alaikum and peace be with you. This is Imam Malik Mujahid and you're watching Muslim Network TV. You can always watch us on Galaxy 19 Satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and of course on our own website, muslimnetwork.tv, as well as YouTube and social media. And uh, it's just uh, interesting, there was a time when I was young, myself and many others will regularly march against nuclear weapons. We don't see that any often. A nuclear device no larger than the traditional bomb can devastate an entire city by blast, fire and radiation. I have stood in Hiroshima seeing, watching and visualizing the destructive power of atomic bomb. And now hydrogen bomb generates explosive force 100 to 100, 100 to 1000 times the destructive power of Hiroshima bomb. Nuclear weapons seems to be like an old issue from a previous generation and a previous time. We don't hear young people talking about it. Where's the doomsday clock run by the atomic scientists say, we're just 100, second, 100 seconds away from the doomsday. Why nuclear scientists are worried about it and the world doesn't seem to care. Earlier last year, first time in human history, a nuclear power India bombed another nuclear power, Pakistan. And the bomb with the traditional power, Pakistan shot down the Indian plane. And, uh, but that challenged the deterrence theory that if everybody has a nuclear bomb, people will not use it. There'll be peace between them. Then later on, I saw at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, one of the major think tanks in America, one Indian scholar presenting a theory that the nuclear power can still engage in traditional warfare. Hmm. So a theory is being promoted for ongoing traditional warfare by between two nuclear powers. Well, what is the time when one of them will say enough is enough? and use the nuclear bomb. Insane, isn't it? Well, there are some sane people, I must say, they're doing insane things to point out the dangerous insanity of the nuclear power. In April of last year, 2018, seven peace activists broke into Naval Submarine Base in Kings Bay, Georgia home of several nuclear armed submarines. Once inside, they carried out nonviolent actions to protest the US nuclear weapon system. They spilled their own blood on the property, beat weapons with hammers, and put crime scene tape around the base. All seven were arrested and convicted one of those Catholic peace activists was Martha Hannesay. Welcome, Martha. Thank you so much. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Hennessy. Hennessy, okay. Tennessee Hennessy. Okay, that will be helpful. Martha Hennessy, my mistake. I normally check beforehand. Uh, Martha Hennessy is seventh grandchild of Dorothy Day. She divides her time between family farm in Vermont and practicing the works of mercy at Mary House Catholic Workers in New York City. She's 64, a retired occupational therapist and a grandmother of eight. She has been imprisoned protesting war and nuclear weapons uh, the use of drones and the torture of prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. 
She has traveled to several countries, including Russia, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and Korea, and Palestine to understand the impact of US military policy and war in other countries. Um, she travels and speaks on the topics of life and work in community Catholic teachings, nuclear revolution, and peacemaking efforts in the tradition of Catholic workers' movement. Thank you for being on our show. Thank you for having me. I came to know Catholic Workers Movement through Kathy Kelly, who I consider to be my mentor in the peace movement and an icon in Chicago's peace uh, movement in the community. Um, so you were one of the seven who entered the Naval submarine base. How were you able to enter a base? Don't they have some protective systems there? Yes, it's a very huge base, um, 17,000 acres. And we clipped a padlock at a remote gate and walked for an hour or two. And it, you know, I, I, the last plowshares action in 2012, there, it did trigger a congressional hearing because three people did enter the plutonium, plutonium um, facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And the question always comes up, well, how secure are these weapons? You know, if someone really put their mind to um, getting to them, um, it does happen. Hmm. So you were able to walk inside the base for one hour before you being detected? Yes. Uh, and in fact, you know, we broke into three different groups and the base, the moment it understood that we were there, I had to secure the nuclear warhead bunker first and foremost. So the others of us were neglected and ignored and driven past for about an hour while they were dealing with the other site. Hmm. So, so that does raise a question, how safe these things are. You are the peacemaker. You didn't mean any harm to anyone. Um, so, but if some a nation or some of those nuts in our country who have this Malaysia or that Malaysia want to sabotage or control anything or destroy China because we hate China or destroy um, any other country. I mean, this is a, this is a one of probably major reason why these uh, things uh, need to be under control or safe. Uh, so, so you were able to reach uh, and put hammer to those bombs? No, no one would ever strike on one of the warheads. They're in bunkers. This is a symbolic sacramental disarmament action. And in some of the actions, they were able to, you know, put hammer symbolically to nose cones at the manufacturing plants. Um, but we raised um, the issue of the nuclear weapons by, you know, posting an indictment that referenced the, the treaties and the Nuremberg principles and the Geneva Convention saying that these weapons are illegal. And we also left a book by uh, Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers called The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. It's all about educating, um, educating the people on the base about what their jobs really do entail. And this particular base um, can strike anywhere on the planet within 15 minutes. And we also hung a banner that said, Trident, um, the logic, the ultimate logic of Trident is omnicide. And we took that from Martin Luther King's um, slogan of the ultimate logic of racism is genocide. I saw that. That was the banner which you had on display when before you entered, right? Yes, we had three banners. The, the third one was uh, nuclear weapons, illegal, immoral. Okay. So... So were you able to, you know, when you're doing that, you, you were detained, were you able to talk to some people who were detaining you? I'm sorry, willing to, able to talk to people at the base? Yes. Yes, well, the arresting officers who came to us, you know, we read our, our action statement to them. Um, we were interrogated for several hours afterwards, and, you know, we do our best to 
speak truth to power and give them facts and information um, as best we can under those conditions. And then the other two parts of the action take place in the US federal courtrooms. And then the third component is ministry in the prisons. And with all three of those steps, we do our best to talk about um, nuclear weapons and, and get the topic out into the public. So this is a, uh, this whole thing is educational process which you engage in. <clears throat> educational and spiritual, and it's, it's a very, very serious proposition. So, so where the case stands right now? I mean, has the judge decided what will happen to you? We were put on trial last October and we were found guilty of four counts, conspiracy, depredation of government property, destruction of naval property and trespass. And now we await sentencing. We did have a sentencing date of June 29th, but now that has been extended to July 31st because of the pandemic. We do want to appear before the judge in person. That is our constitutional right. We do not want to appear um, remote video. And with the pandemic, it's dangerous to travel. So we have dragged our feet and um, received another delay. And so July 31st and 30th, um, the rest of the folks will be sentenced. Liz McAllister was already sentenced to time serve. So if your purpose is educational, is spiritual, spiritual is between yourself and God Almighty. Um, the educational is with other people. So this is not probably the first action against the nuclear weapons, and probably it will not be the last one. But what lessons were learned from this educational exercise uh, which you plan to apply for future? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I certainly, I still have to give my sentencing statement. And with that, I am supposed to express remorse and a willingness to never behave this way again. Um, I'm, some people have done plowshares actions two to four to six times. Uh, Father Steve Kelly, I'm not sure what number of action this is for him. But what I would say is so critical to learn is that the weapons are made so invisible and so unspeakable and so difficult. Um, with our trial in the federal court, we were not allowed any kind of a defense. And in fact, at one point, one of the jurors asked the question, are there nuclear weapons on that base? And no one was allowed to answer that question to the juror. And it's amazing to watch how the federal courts have successfully for 30 years disallowed expert testimony on the legality of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. So, you know, the lessons learned for me are that we all must keep trying the best we can, you know, as long as we can, as long as we have these weapons. I think what is different today is that Pope Francis is spoke, speaking out very clearly for nuclear abolition. And, you know, the doomsday clock, as you mentioned, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists now have it at 100 seconds to midnight under the current U.S. administration. And the dangers just continue to increase. And the, the longer we practice this brinksmanship, you know, the more of a chance there is that there'll be something terrible that will happen. But in fact, the Pentagon does have a first strike limited nuclear strike plan, which is completely illegal. When you say limited, what does that mean? There's something called the WD2 nuclear warhead that has been sent out that is five kilotons. It was sent out from Kings Bay around Christmas time, a gift from the, the Christians. And it was sent, I think, towards the Middle East. And, you know, we th this bomb is small. I think that the Pentagon, and there are some people in the US military and the administration who believe that a first limited strike is winnable. And it's it's incredibly extremely dangerous. So the so the theory is that uh, 
uh, before anybody does anything uh, with the nuclear warhead, you use yours to destroy theirs, and that's the victory? Is that the concept? I guess you take out their ability to strike back. Hmm. Um, you know, de deterrence is a false premise. Um, it's, it's, it, they've been debating this for decades now, and I don't know the complete ins and outs of it, or I can, I can barely grasp the rationale that these people are, are, are trying to use. Hmm. Um, but, you know, the United States is, is becoming very arrogant. You're watching Muslim Network TV, and this is Imam Malik Mujahid talking with Martha Hennessy, and we'll be right back after these messages. We are the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. Building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. On June 20th, we will rise together for the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington, a digital justice gathering. On June 20th, we will come together to lift the voices and faces of poverty in the midst of pandemic. Rise with us. Visit June2020.org. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. Um, I'm talking with Martha Hennessy. Um, share with us, um, is America fully aware of what a nuclear bomb does? No. How could they? You know, we have never suffered under bombs. Um, we have never had whole cities destroyed. You know, our greatest destruction was with the Civil War, and that was pre-modern warfare. And with the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, the public was very much um, protected from seeing images of what had occurred there. So no, we don't have enough of an understanding of what it means. So what is the... Uh, that's okay. She can participate. Uh, uh, I mean, she's your cat is saying she agrees with you that America doesn't know about what is going on at this moment about the nuclear warfare. So, so, so in educational process, don't you think the exhibits and artifact from Hiroshima should travel in America to mm -hmm. educate people? That is a wonderful thought. Yes. Um, we have done such a thorough job of um, brainwashing the people and, and having them forget about this incident, this history. You know, we're, we're the only country who has dropped the bomb. And, you know, my grandmother used to say, the great scandal is that these weapons are in the hands of white Christians. And I think it, the more education we can do, I mean, We've just done, I, I'm so ignorant of my own country's history in many, many ways. So the more that we can educate, the better. But there has to be a political will there. Um, the industry dictates to us what we learn and how we learn it. The capitalist system dictates um, so much of what happens in our lives that 
I think the question is how to overcome the censorship with our media. So the um, what what is the state of nuclear uh, anti nuke movement? And your group is one. How many other groups are there? Um, I'm no expert at that. We have nuclear resistor in Wisconsin, and um, I'm sorry, nuclear resistor in uh, Tucson, Arizona, and Nuke Watch in uh, Luck, Wisconsin. And these are newsletters that have been published for over 30 years where they try to keep track of the nuclear weapons systems, the geopolitical situation, and the prisoners who are actually serving time resisting uh, the nuclear arsenal here in the US. But as far as the public um, movement, uh, you know, I think that the peace movement in the United States has been in disarray since the United States destroyed Iraq and I think it's very hard for people to regroup when there are so many distractions and people have more of a hardship in taking care of themselves and paying their bills and raising and educating their children. Um, the United States has changed drastically in the past uh, 30 years, economically and um, socially. So, I mean, the problems are multifaceted and run very, very deep. So is there any any entity or any group which sort of uh, does a coordinating meeting of all the uh, anti-nuclear weapon groups so they can communicate with each other and share with the, uh, share ideas how to amplify each other's voice? Yes, well, we have ICANN, International Committee on the Abolition of uh, Nuclear Weapons. And in July of 2017, um, at the UN in New York City, this uh, treaty um, was put together and I, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, and I think it now has 81 signatories and 36 um, states who um, are agreeing that this needs to go into effect. and. You know, thank God that that work has been done and that the international effort really has um, made a difference. And I think we are coming to a place in history where the world is very receptive to um, abolishing uh, nuclear weapons. I think the, the intransigence of the United States and perhaps Russia to a lesser degree is what we're really dealing with here. Well, so if the United States uh, is the main party, which need to be mobilized, uh, so so if the world agrees and the United States and Russia and some of the countries are, are blocking, uh, so your job of mobilizing America and educating America becomes more critical. Is, yes. uh, I mean, America is no longer committed to the earlier uh, commitment to reduce or limit the nuclear weapons. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. And as a Catholic myself, I feel that the U.S. Catholic Church plays an extremely critical role in raising a voice. And, and Pope Francis has raised that voice, and the U.S. Catholic bishops are not responding the way they need to be responding. And yes, the United States is the sole superpower in the world today. And it, it definitely rests with us to look at unilateral disarmament and nuclear abolition globally. So we have nine nuclear states at this point in time. And, you know, work needs to be done. Reagan and Gorbachev had a discussion that could have led to nuclear abolition in 1989, and it's the corporate interests that prevented it. It's the it's the weapons industry that dictates. It's it's not simply um, Congress and the Pentagon going along with it, along with um, fooling the public, and the legislators also play a role in continually approving of these budgets without number one understanding the incredible destructiveness of these bombs and number two not looking into the cost of these bombs 
And number three, ignoring what the public actually does want. So the more education that is done, the better. So if America is critical for the nuclear disarmament and uh, America doesn't know much about it, Mm. uh, what is the focus on younger generation? Because they have done an amazing job when it comes to uh, climate change uh, campaigns. They have done an amazing job at least marching, if not achieving results in the gun control in our country. And now the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, these are younger people. These are not old politicians of uh, black community. These are younger people. Yeah. Uh, what can be done to get younger people and this generation become aware of the dangers of nuclear bomb and the responsibility our country has towards it? Very good question. And I don't know that I have the answer. I am happy to see that there is uh, resistance, open resistance now in the streets. And apparently we seem to be more psychically capable of looking at and addressing climate disruption. I think the thing that we really steer away from is looking at the U.S. military as the largest carbon footprint in this um, world and the difficulties that that produces. People are looking at being shot in the streets by the police. People are looking at unemployment. We now have 42 million unemployed. These are circumstances that Dorothy faced at the height of the depression in 1933 with the birth of the Catholic worker movement, born out of crisis. I can only hope and pray that all of these um, issues will be connected. I mean, we, we purposefully chose the um, 50th anniversary of the killing of Martin Luther King Jr. to do our action because, because we wanted to highlight the triplets, his triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism. And certainly white supremacy and capitalism is what's holding all of this together. And it's the threat of the nuclear bomb that is the bully stick around the globe. And until we can connect all of the issues, um, we will be sort of stuck at a lower level um, trying to deal with one issue at a time. But they are, in my mind, all interconnected. So I have great hope that um, these things will all come together. I do believe that the Poor People's Campaign with Reverend Barbara is a very um, critical um, movement right now. Well, uh, Reverend Barber's uh, Poor People's Campaign, we interviewed them and uh, on our Muslim Network TV, we'll give a live coverage of the whole uh, on uh, June 20th, uh, <coughs> God willing. Now, uh, we will talk a little more about it, but tell me, you know, the, let's talk, I mean, in terms of education. Uh, there was some book out there in the past that if a nuclear bomb hits uh, Manhattan, mm -hmm. the Manhattan is the where you have a center for homeless people. Mm -hmm. uh, what type of devastation we're looking at uh, if something like that happens to Manhattan? Millions of people will die instantaneously. Um, the Catholic worker did start um, a protest against the air raid drills in 1955 at the height of the Cold War. Everyone was told to go duck and cover and, you know, take shelter down in the subways. And Dorothy understood that to be insane psychological warfare, and she refused to participate. And yes, Manhattan, you know, it's the Empire State in, this, uh, in the center of the U.S. Empire. Um, it would be absolutely horrific. I mean, but no more horrific than bombing Moscow or Tokyo or Tehran or any other city on the earth. Um, I mean, I'm not a good scientific mind at remembering numbers or statistics, but all I know is that a nuclear explosion anywhere hmm. is going to be God's nightmare. Yeah. It is said that for for millionth of a second, Manhattan, uh, the center of the bomb, will be as hot as the center of the sun. 
Yeah. And the uh, whole thing will be evaporated. Even people who are in those subways and uh, shelters, uh, they will suffocate uh, because there will be no <clears throat> fresh air for them. I mean, I have stood in Hiroshima and Nagasaki seeing their uh, museum and uh, whatever is left of those buildings. Mm -hmm. I mean, that thing was very tiny. Now there are thousands of times more power in yeah. these norms and uh, nobody seems to realize that so education is a whole lot of uh, responsibility and we will talk about a little more with martha hennessy when we come back you're watching muslim network tv we're always on galaxy 19 satellite amazon fire tv raku as well as muslim network tv we'll be right back after these messages <music> We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. Past campaigns covered a wide range of humanitarian concerns. Through Bosnia Task Force, Imams and leaders of Chicago's Muslim community worked to ensure Bosnia became a top national issue. This led to life-saving American policies in Bosnia. A key accomplishment was helping to get rape declared a war crime. Initiatives also included Kosovo Task Force, Central African Republic Task Force, and Flint Coalition, which brought awareness to the water crisis affecting the people of Flint, Michigan. Highlights of our work include supporting Black Lives Matter, Parliament of the World Religions, addressing climate change. So wasteful consumption starts the ruthless production, and that's where we need all the fossil fuel in the world. And prominent media exposure. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, uh, president of Justice for All. And I'm the director of outreach for Justice for All. And that's why we need to go back to what worked. Today Hopefully. we're demanding an apology uh, from the CEO of Costco. The Chinese crackdown on Uyghurs and other Turkic people has only gotten worse. Current programs such as Burma Task Force advocate for the rights of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, internally displaced populations, and all those denied freedom of movement and at risk of starvation. Through this, we mobilized thousands of calls to elected representatives. This paved the way for the U.S. to increase funding for Rohingya refugees from $30 million to $210 million. Two of our documentaries were featured on international news outlets. The Rohingya People, A Slow-Burning Genocide, on BBC World News, and Rohingya Refugees Tell of Massacre was featured on CNN. We've organized rallies, UN mission visits, expanded presentations on campuses, promoted research and report writing, outreach to think tanks, media, and other influencers. Faith Coalition educates about the Rohingya genocide and crimes against humanity faced by ethnic groups in Burma. We've traveled to refugee camps, convened a meeting of Karen, Kachin, and Rohingya leaders, both to encourage cooperation and to guide them in congressional outreach. We organized Rohingya Advocacy Day. This led to over 100 participants visiting the offices of 60 U.S. Senators and congressional representatives. Free Kashmir advocates for the people of Kashmir. Long-term goals include the call for self-determination, the end of the Indian military's occupation of the territory, and raising awareness of Kashmiri issues among the American people. 
After the August 5th reinvasion of Kashmir, we organized national protests in front of various Indian government buildings, partnered with Stand With Kashmir, and launched a petition condemning the Gates Foundation's decision to present Prime Minister Modi a humanitarian award. Save Uyghur informs Muslims and neighbors of other faiths about the ongoing cultural genocide of Uyghur Muslims and mobilizes public support. Our projects include boycotting Chinese products with our Fast From China campaign, pushing Bill S-178 in the Senate, and organizing a nationwide protest of Costco. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. We are the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. Building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. On June 20th, we will rise together for the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington, a digital justice gathering. On June 20th, we will come together to lift the voices and faces of poverty in the midst of pandemic. Rise with us. Visit June2020.org. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with uh, Martha Hanizi, who is the first line in her bio says that she is the granddaughter of Dorothy Day. Who was Dorothy Day? Dorothy was born in 1897. And in her youth, she was in the thick of it with the Bohemian community of um, New York City. Her father and her brothers were journalists and she chose that um, vocation as well. She is an adult um, Catholic convert. Um, she did a lot of uh, reporting in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s around labor issues. There was a great socialist movement happening in the United States. Our country could have taken a very different direction than it has. And she converted um, with the birth of my mother, Tamar, um, 1927, she was baptized. And she started what's called the Catholic Worker Movement in 1933. The country was in great disarray, internal displacement of many, many people. Um, the labor unions were simply struggling to have families be able to take care of their children and have a livable wage. And she just spent the next, um, nearly 50 years taking care of the homeless and the poor in New York City, the Bowery, a very um, impoverished section of the city, which has now been gentrified. And she dedicated herself to Catholic social teachings. Um, she considered Peter Morin, a Catholic, a French Catholic peasant, to be the founder of the movement. And he is the one who educated her on Catholic social teachings. And they started a newspaper and their stamina and their faith and their uh, endurance was was quite impressive. So what are the Catholic social teachings? Everyone is born in the image of God. We are all to be um, revered. Every human life is to be revered. There's a preferential option for the poor where we are to provide for the least among us, the most vulnerable. There are several encyclicals that have been written by different popes um, in terms of how to guide us in right livelihood, uh, the dignity of work, and to not engage in wars that are unjust. Um, it's a huge body of knowledge and study, and I have to confess, I haven't done enough homework in that area, but the Catholic social teachings guide us. Dorothy talked about Matthew 25, the Sermon on the Mount um, of being our um, manifesto. Mm -hmm. when, did you, when did you not feed me? When did you not give me um, food? When did you not clothe me? Christ asks. 
uh, and the, the, the disciples ask, and Christ simply says, when you did not take care of the least among us. So that is what the Catholic worker has attempted to do all these decades. So the Catholic uh, workers movement uh, was born uh, uh, when uh, 2019, 23? 33. At the 1933, all right. And uh, you were born in the, into the movement, it seems. Yes, I was born in 1955, the first year that they resisted the air raid drills. Okay, so, and now, how big is the Catholic workers' movement? Um, there are loosely, there's, it's a loosely held definition of, of what makes a Catholic worker, but there are probably 200 communities around the country and around the world. And the, the, the basic premise is one of voluntary poverty. You live poor, you live simply so that others may have enough and that you do the hospitality, the care of the poor, and that you resist, resist injustice. And for me, somehow it's, it's a perfect model of um, true Christian practice. So if it is the true Christian practice, uh, the Catholic bishops and everybody must be on board, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you came up with your own theology, which uh, the Catholic hierarchy doesn't quite buy in? Um, no, Dorothy was considered a devout daughter of the church, and she followed the Catholic doct doctrine accurately and, and consistently. Um, you know, and the bishops gave her a very difficult time in her lifetime. Uh, she spoke out against the Spanish Civil War. She spoke out against World War II. She spoke out against the Cold War, the Vietnam War, the Korean War. She witnessed all of these wars in her lifetime. And she felt that the teachings of Christ, you know, telling Peter to put up his sword, and those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Um, you are to die for your friends rather than kill the enemy. And, you know, that kind of practice isn't necessarily what you see in the church hierarchy. Um, you know, over the centuries, things have changed drastically since the first 300 years of the Christian community where people were being hunted down and martyred. Um, the Catholic Church is now a very powerful entity. And, you know, the Catholics coming to the United States wanted to fit in to this, this empire and this model. And they didn't want to be persecuted and they didn't want to be marginalized. And so Dorothy was a very um, important voice in her lifetime, you know, calling the church to task about what the work truly is, the works of mercy. So... So Catholic uh, workers' movement uh, was not accepted by mainstream Catholics. Uh, how many Catholics are there in America? I think 30% of America probably is Catholic, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's a significant amount. 25% of the U.S. military is Catholic. The large percentage of the Supreme Court is Catholic. And look how they operate. Um, so yes, the, the, the population, the representation um, is fairly significant. And if Catholics were to raise the voice that um, Pope Francis is trying to encourage us to raise, it could have a significant impact on how we do things and how we are in a permanent war economy. These are the things that really must change. So, so you are following the steps of your grandma, Dorothy Day. Uh, who among your children or grandchildren are following that path? <laughs> I'm the only practicing Catholic in the family for several generations. Okay. Um, no, that's a tough question. I mean, I, I can't even explain myself in terms of how I returned to the church and how I returned to the Catholic worker. But it certainly makes me very nervous when people describe me as following in her footsteps. Um, that's a tough, tough order. So, so she she's also noted in saying that uh, Catholic economic theory of distribution uh, is a third way between capitalism and socialism. 
um, and capitalism and socialism being the uh, at at her time probably were the more prominent two ways. And now the socialism of uh, uh, China is mm -hmm. essentially authoritarian capitalism. Uh, um, and that is a the mother of destructive capitalism now. Uh, so, but but in two ways, and she thinks that Catholic uh, theory of distribution is a third way. That do you know anything about uh, what is that theory? No, I'm quite ignorant and not very well educated in those theories. Um, but probably based on what you just said about you know taking care of poor and the needy and. Uh, equal distribution instead of concentration of wealth in some hands, right? Yeah, it's a very basic, simple human concept. Yeah. You know, what we try to teach children at a very young age. Hmm. Don't hit and share. <laughs> share more and consume less. I mean, this is something which I have been doing in my family yeah. as well as in my teachings. I mean, in Islam also, likewise, you know, there has been, you know, when there was a big debate between communism and capitalism in Pakistan, where I was raised uh, initial days, that there was always a call of the third way, uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a considerate way. And now it is evolved into something called Islamic economics and Islamic banking. There are thousands of uh, uh, banks and uh, who follow these models and there are it is said to be a four or five trillion dollar economy. Uh, but when I was growing up in the 60s, people used to just talk about it. There should be a third way between capitalism and socialism. Yeah. And the teachings would they articulate all these theses and banks are more or less the same which you described. So I wonder if the, if the basic teachings of faith, because all faith, uh, I believe, are revealed faith uh, from God Almighty. As a Muslim, we are supposed to not supposed to, we are asked to believe in the teachings of Jesus and Moses and, uh, uh, you know, all uh, the, all sent by God Almighty and all these scriptures. There's, there is a common element of human beings being cared for. I mean, there is a strong emphasis in our ethics about uh, distribution of wealth. And yeah. uh, there are instituted measures of uh, uh, reducing the concentration of wealth. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so teachings, you know, so when I saw the Dorothy Day uh, has this theory uh, that Catholic economic theory of distributionism, I thought, wow, <laughs> this is something which I'm familiar with uh, from my childhood. So, so, so what is the, I mean, Catholic workers movement, you mentioned there are 200 or so, um, houses. Have you visited many of those houses? Yes, I, I've, I've been to the LA Catholic Worker, the Houston Catholic Worker, the Baltimore Catholic Worker, Hartford, Connecticut, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, Milwaukee. Um, I've tried to, you know, make the rounds to get the no folks and it's a it's a wonderful incredible thing i mean each house has to develop its own ministry in its own neighborhood based on those immediate local needs and i think the idea of distributism um you know we have a clothing room where people bring their donations and people are just constantly consuming buying and getting rid of clothing and other articles and Mary House functions beautifully as a way to redistribute the excess. Um, New York City produces an incredible amount of garbage per, per year. And, you know, much of what gets thrown away is perfectly uh, usable. And so the houses just do what they can, where they can. And right now, between the pandemic and the protests, um, hunger is setting in. You know, mm -hmm. the, the ap apocalypto biblical events of um, uh, famine and plague and war. I mean, it's all happening around us. And for me, the answer is distributism. Mm. So 
So consuming less and sharing more and being thoughtful about what we are discarding, could it be usable by other human beings? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are great thoughts. So, so do these uh, 200 houses, uh, do they connect with each other one of uh, this place or they are all independent? Uh, we're all, we consider ourselves anarchists. <laughs> so, you know, people, do things their own ways, you know, trying to A follow. Nonviolent anarchist, I must say. Yes, the the, the voluntary poverty, the pacifism, are, are very critical um, components, and so all of the houses. We do have a national gathering every five years, um, but there's no big boss, and there's no, you know, set structure uh, other than um, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. And many of the houses don't practice Catholicism. Um, I think that, you know, the, the movement is now 87 years old, and I think the longevity of it could be contributed to our tolerance and our diversity. Um, but then there are others who may argue that the movement is not what it used to be or what it should be in these times. So it's all, it's all very challenging. So you, you mentioned your, your organization as an archist. Um, is being an archist a, is something appreciable by the society? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? <clears throat> you, you mentioned you're sort of an archist. Yeah. What is an archist? Well, we don't need police to tell us to be good. We we need to do what's right. We need to practice our, our faith-based um, generosity and loving kindness. And, you know, it's nonviolent anarchism. It's not violence. And it's self-regulation. And, you know, to trust that people actually do know how to behave and take care of themselves. I, I think that the capitalist system just unleashes greed. The capitalist system um, dictates shortages and tells everyone to get what they can for themselves. And you know that's the opposite of distributism and um, Sabbath, what they call Sabbath economics, where God gave us enough. We need to learn how to bridle our greed. Uh, greed is something. Yeah. You know, the, the greed is the one, you know, consuming more and more and more we consume, uh, more demand creates uh, for production and people want to produce more and more for us to buy cheap and cheap. Yeah. And more they want to produce, the more fossil fuels are consumed. And that's where the destruction of the planet, along with mm -hmm. we destroying ourselves spiritually by consuming so much. Yes, yeah, so we, we live in a finite ecology and ecosystem and yet we're told to infinitely consume so so your grandmother dorothy uh day was uh, arrested 11 times how many how many times have you been arrested uh i don't know um as phil berrigan would say not enough, <laughs> not enough. <laughs> i've been arrested around issues of nuclear power nuclear weapons, the use of drones to kill from long distance, and the use of torture in Guantanamo. And I don't know, I don't know how many times I've been arrested. So not that many. So this, uh, uh, this Guantanamo Bay, I mean, just like nuclear weapon, nobody seems to talk about what happening in Guantanamo Bay. Is it still there? Yes. There are, I think, 40 prisoners still there you know, going on to nearly 20 years now. No okay. charges, no, no, no being brought to trial, no, not, no following of the rule of law. And many of them have been on hunger strike. Um, there's been some incredible poetry written while they were there suffering, the horrific suffering that they've been undergoing. And, you know, this is left over with the 9-11 events and the endless war on terror. And I do believe that the United States keeps a foothold there. The Cubans don't want it to be there anymore, but the foothold is there as a means to um, be able to control the population, to, you know, to send political dissidents into prisons, like what the Soviet Union did. I think that we're perfectly capable of behaving that way 
And we, there are detention centers all around the country now, right now. That's how we are treating the refugees from South and Central America. They are coming here as a result of the wars we wage down there and the economic war that's going on. It's just an endless litany of not taking responsibility and causing immense human suffering. And it's got to end. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Martha Hennessy is a seventh grandchild of Dorothy Day and a leader of Catholic Workers Movement. Thank you so much for being on Muslim Network TV. I truly appreciate that. Thank you. I'm not a leader. I'm a volunteer. <laughs> well, yes, you're an anarchist. No one is a leader, right? <laughs> we need right. examples in each other. Uh, you can always watch us on Galaxy 19 Satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and uh, on our website, muslimnetwork.tv. We're also on social media and YouTube. And uh, thank you for our uh, producer, intern producer, Sumaya Heather, and thank you, Zahra Nadim, for producing our show today. Uh, peace and salam. Shalom alaikum. Peace to you. Thank you.